Hi, my name is Emma Einson and I'm the Church of England uh, Bishop of Kensington in London. And I've written a book called Failure, what Jesus said about sin, mistakes and messing stuff up. And in this seminar, we're going to think about failure, what it is and what it's not, how to cope with it and even grow through it and what Jesus said about it. But first, let me tell you a story. It was a wild and stormy night, as they often tend to be in the depths of Cumbria. And as Bishop of Penrith, as I was at the time, I was driving home from a meeting over the mountains late at night. The wind was blowing and the rain was lashing down. And as I rounded a corner, probably going a little faster than I should have done in my haste to get home, my wheels must have brushed against some debris that had been washed from the walls at the side of the road. Now, these walls that edge the fields uh, in Cumbria are beautiful in the light of day. They are the very essence of the Lake District. But at night, in the wet, they can become very treacherous as bits of them get washed into the narrow roads. Anyway, what happened that night as I drove too fast, too close to the edge, was that I got a puncture in not one, but two tyres. In the dark, in the middle of nowhere, in a place with no phone signal. Now, as you can see, because I am here, alive and well, it all turned out okay. So why do I tell you this story? Well, I tell it because now, if I were to drive at night in Cumbria, I would drive much more carefully and slowly and away from the edges. It was a horrible failure, but I've learned from it. And now I live better, or certainly drive better, because of it. Now, of course, I told you there about a failure story I was willing to admit on a video seminar. Uh, there are many that I'm not prepared to share with you. But the point is that you and I will have a whole range of failures that have peppered our lives and still do today. Some of which we've learned from and grown through and some of which we haven't. Sometimes I think we make the same mistakes again and again and we don't learn from them. Some failures obviously are fairly inconsequential, like my double puncture, although it didn't feel like it at the time. And some failures are to be embraced as a gateway to new learning and new creative ways of doing things. As Thomas Edison purportedly said on his way to inventing the electric light bulb, I have not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. Some failures, of course, are to be avoided at all costs because they cause great harm. Oh, don't worry if it goes wrong, you can learn from it and try again. It's probably quite a good thing to say to a development scientist or an artist, but probably not so good to a brain surgeon. So how do we tell the difference? What is good failure and what is bad failure? How do we get better at making better mistakes? And what is failure anyway? And how do we live well in the midst of it? For much as we might not love it, failure is simply part of our human story. Ever since Eve said to Adam in the Garden of Eden, here, try some of this. Humans have been a failing people, and so we better get used to it. Rather than avoiding it, how can we learn from it? And more importantly, how can we see God at work in and through our failures? Elizabeth Day, in her hugely popular How to Fail podcast, defines failure simply like this. Failure is what happens when something doesn't go according to plan. But of course, that leads to the question, whose plan? Sometimes something might look like failure because someone else has made a plan that is wrong or might not be the right plan for you. And as the Bible tells us, God's plans are very often not our plans or God's thoughts, our thoughts. So I guess the question for me is, by whose plan do we set our criteria for success and failure? Ours or God's? 
The Bible, I think, reframes what we think of as success and failure. I think if I'd been writing the Bible, I would have bigged up the successes a little bit more. Uh, but the Bible is brutal in its honesty and its realism about failure. It's woven right through its pages. Often we hear that failure is something that you have to go through on the pathway to great success. If you look on the uh, bookshelves, many popular books on this subject are written like that, and they have titles like this, From Failure to Success, or Chasing Failure, How Falling Short Sets You Up for Success, or Failing Forward, Turning Mistakes into Stepping Stones for Success. But the picture that we see in the Bible is more often, and perhaps more realistically, not failure giving way to rip-roaring success, but rather a much more messy picture of apparent success followed by failure and eventual redemption by God. But maybe not in the ways that we expected. The success of creation, the pinnacle of which is humankind, is followed by the failure of the fall and banishment from the garden. The success of the flight from Egypt is followed by 40 years of failure and wandering in the desert. The success of the law being given to Moses on the mountaintop is followed by the failure of God's people as they worship a golden calf. The success of the promised land is followed by the failure of exile. The success of King David is followed by his own moral failure. And then the success of Jesus' ministry is followed by the apparent failure of the cross. The success of God's Holy Spirit being poured out on all people is followed by the story of the church being persecuted and scattered. The success of Pentecost is followed by 2,000 years of the fallible church dividing and splitting and sinning and failing even as it grows and spreads. So is failure really something that you encounter on the road to success? Or is it more often the other way round? And then, of course, there is the cross. Did the cross represent failure for Jesus? We know, of course, in the light of the resurrection, that it all turned out OK, uh, which is the understatement of the century. We know that through the cross came great victory. But as Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced a separation from his father that must have felt very much like failure. The cross really was the failure to end all failures. So I think uh, that Christians ought to be really good at failure. Our faith story equips us well for it. Jesus, of course, was and is brilliant with failures. It is, after all, all he's got to work with. But he accepted and he forgave and he ministered with people who had failed. And he trained his disciples for failure. He sent them out to do his work and to preach his good news as sheep amongst wolves. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And he said, if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet. Try, fail, move on. So let's look at living well with failure. Perhaps failure is a little bit like living with COVID. We wish it wasn't part of our lives, but it is. So we need to learn to live with it. We could allow failure to stop us from doing anything at all, like COVID restricting our movements and stopping us trying new things. But perhaps it's better to take sensible precautions to limit its effects, to learn to fail safely in ways that don't hurt others, and to just get on with living. So how can we be really successful failures? I've got five suggestions. Number one, Learn to live with the mess. Now, when I get stressed, I don't know what you do, but I tidy my linen cupboard. There's just something about bringing order out of chaos that makes me think I'm somehow in control of my life, even if I'm not. But what I can do with my sheets and my pillowcases, folding them tidily, I cannot do with the world around me. 
Life is messy and failure is part of it, much as I might wish it wasn't. There's something about learning to live with the uncertainty and the messiness that everyday life brings that I think we really need at the moment. We live in an age of uncertainty. So much of what we once took for granted is in flux. And those who can exist within the chaos will be less frustrated and maybe less disappointed than those who expect everything to be always amazing. Perhaps the mental health of young people might be improved by admission that life naturally has ups and downs and it's not always an Instagrammed, photoshopped marvel. Perhaps we all just need to hear the message. Just because this part of life is a struggle doesn't mean your whole life is a failure. After all, God created the earth. It says in Genesis uh, 1 verse 2, out of complete chaos, a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. In Hebrew, the words for chaos and darkness and deep and waters all held rich resonances of a fearful, primordial mess. But God shaped order out of that chaos. But chaos isn't bad in and of itself when we give it to God. Number two, allow others to fail. One of the best ways to deal with failure is to realise that you're not alone. Failure is a club that we're all part of. There are some companies and workplaces, apparently, that have begun to hold failure parties where everyone shares something that's gone wrong and what they've learned from it so that everyone benefits from that learning. Perhaps we may need to try that more in the church. I once invited a group of senior leaders to safely share with each other in small groups something that they had failed at or got wrong recently. They could choose what and how much they shared, but the effect was unifying, as one by one they realised that even the most senior amongst them had messed up in some way or another. One of the benefits of sharing our failures is that it gives permission for others to do the same and to be open about our failures, learning from what has happened. Imagine what life would look like if we truly allowed others to fail just as we do. One of the most neglected gifts, I think, in our culture at present is patience. We're not very patient. We expect everything to be done perfectly and immediately. And when something goes wrong, we demand to know what happened and who is to blame. Our arguments and our disagreements are rarely nuanced and considerate, even in the church. Often we're shrill and impatient with each other. Patience, I think, is the art of making room for repentance which may not happen overnight. Patience is the space after failure. So can we be more patient with each other and give each other what the old prayer book calls time for amendment of life? Number three, feel the fear and do it anyway. That's the title of a book written by Susan Jeffers in the 1980s that encouraged people to embrace their fears but not to let them stop them doing things, to move forward with the things that they've always wanted to do in life. It's natural to fear failure and to do what we can to avoid the embarrassment and the shame of getting things wrong. But most of life involves taking risks day by day. And in times of uncertainty, such as we're living through now, simply getting out of bed in the morning can seem like a fairly risky proposition. But as 1 Timothy 2, 7 reminds us, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. I wonder if in the church especially our fear of failure prevents us from trying new things and so we trundle along with what we know is safe and predictable. A good question maybe to ask in any situation and to ask each other is what would I do if I were not afraid? 
Fourthly, learn to see the funny side. Failure can be bad and awful, of course, but it can also be quite funny. In the middle of the COVID lockdown, I made a little video of all the outtakes that my friends had sent me of those times when things had gone wrong, when they were recording their online worship, mostly in their own homes. Dogs walking across screens at crucial moments in sermons, getting our murds waddled, interruptions of various kinds. And all of those mistakes didn't appear in the final versions, of course, they were edited out. The video that I put together seemed to really strike a chord with many people and it made me wonder why was that? I think it was mainly because so many of us saw ourselves in those clips, all of us trying to muddle along despite circumstances. Often we tend to present our shiny, finished sides to others and to keep our failures hidden in shame and embarrassment. But our actual failures can not only be quite funny, but quite reassuring when we let them be seen. There used to be a day in the church calendar called the Feast of Fools until it was banned by the sensible people. On that occasion, a child would be made a bishop and fun would be poked at various ecclesiastical rituals. There's an important role, I think, in the church for fools, for those who tell the truth and show up the pomposity of what we do for what it is, but do it with humour. Fifthly and finally, remember that failure, whilst very much part of our current experience, is never final. There's a TV programme called The Repair Shop. The premise of this programme is that people bring to the workshop anything that they have that is of great sentimental value, uh, but has become damaged or shabby and is in need of repair. And they explain what the items are and why they mean a lot to them. And then a, a group of expert repairers set about restoring the items to their former glory, sewing up frayed seams, applying a fresh coat of paint, polishing tarnished metal, fixing the mechanisms. And at the end of the programme, there's this wonderful moment where the owners come back to reclaim their objects, which now look like new. And tears often flow uh, from the owners, from the repairers, and often from the viewers, as everyone marvels at how something so precious and yet so broken could be made so shiny and beautiful. What if we viewed the way God deals with our failures in the same way? We've all messed up, we're broken, we've got things wrong and we've damaged ourselves and others. But what if God's promise was to take all that and slowly and carefully and painstakingly, with our help and cooperation, put things right again? When things are broken by failure, the answer is not to throw them out with the rubbish, but to work on repairing them, restoring them. We are a failing people, but our failures remind us of that day that we long for when there will be no more failure, when the home of God is among mortals, when he will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. That's Revelation 21, 3 to 4. Failure is amongst those first things that one day will pass away. And our God is in the business of making all things new. And when you're feeling very down about your failures, remember the Benedictine monk who found that due to cold, damp weather, his carefully stored wine had begun to ferment a second time, creating with it bubbles within it, bubbles of carbon dioxide. What a failure! Discovering that mistake must have been a very bad day for that monk. The name of the monk? Dom Perignon. Cheers, you lovely failures. God bless you.